Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, former France hooker, Benjamin Kayser, and ex-Scotland back row, Johnny Beattie. Bon année, guys. Is it too late to say that? Mid-January? Probably. Never, never too late. You have until oh. the 31st of January to say it. It's, it's always nice to hear, you know, best wishes of this, best wishes of that. I think this year it's health, 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 and the rest you can all get stuffed, right? You, got, you roll your <laughs> sleeves up and you, just, and you just do your own homework. But at the moment it's health, health for everyone and that's it. Exactly. And it can only get better, 100%. Here's to 2021. Absolutely. And how was the end of 2020? Good Christmas, good New Year? Oh, well, uh, I've got a funny story around Christmas because, <clears throat> so I think we got, well, we'll speak about it in a second, but all, all how do you say it? All hell bro broke loose. Is that what you say? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Hello. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, after, after that Bayonne Leicester game, which I commentated for French TV <clears throat> and not knowing that basically that was the game that was going to kick off. You know, the, the shitstorm about the difference of, well, first that English variant that, that arrived in the world and then how it's impacted on rugby and all that. So I commentated that game. I heard that same day that the rugby, uh, Tommy Joel's rugby club, one of the boys tested positive that I coached on a Thursday. So the whole squad had to be, uh, had to be tested. And they're saying because of this new variant, I was hearing like Netherlands shutting the, the borders. And, and I'm in France, huh? two days before Christmas. I would love to be in France for Christmas, but I would still rather be with my wife and girls, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so basically I'm thinking, oh shit, this is going to happen. And please don't tell my wife. Good thing she doesn't listen to the podcast because I didn't take the first flight back. I took the second flight back because like oh, I said mate. to you, Johnny, I wanted to go. I wanted to, Bayonne is an hour and a half from Bordeaux. And Bordeaux is where I have my second Inu Park shop that I, I haven't really seen yet. So I wanted to spend the time to do it. And I'm there in the shop sweating like a piglet because... I'm just looking at the news. Oh, France is shutting board. This is shutting. And I'm trying to call EasyJet to change my flight. No, no, no. This flight is being canceled. And that flight is being canceled. And the other one's being canceled. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, this is going to be long. And all of it. And, you know, bipolar me basically texting my wife at the same time. Yeah, no, it's all right. Don't worry. Yeah, my flight is all good. So, you know, maybe I'll get tested here if I can, if I have the time, you know. But, you know, we're all good. And I get to the, to the, to the airport. Hallelujah. Some whatever reason. Uh, my flight did go at six o'clock or whatever, and if full ramp packed, uh, is to say that they bust your balls about being careful with jail with masks. But then in the flight, everybody was touching each other. I said, like, "What kind of thing is it? It's spaced out people. You know, the world is." What kind of flight was it? Why are you touching thing. each other? Easy jet. <laughs> no, was, no, you know what I mean. <laughs> and it's, it's like, oh well. And so basically, I did get there. We all got tested on the Tuesday. Uh, and everybody's all right. That was really good fun to have to go test my little ones. So elbow in the face, second hand, uh, holding both hands down, and, oh, you know, stuffing those things in the nose. That was no fun, but they did well, oh, and everybody's all right. So I thought I almost got locked, uh, locked there, and then I realized because of that variant, because of that particular game, how much it's impacted the top 14 rugby. So it was a, a fun weekend. And European stuff as well. Now it's gone everywhere. Whole yeah. things locked down. Yeah, I mean, but for I, European, I don't know what you think, Johnny, but they, they didn't really have much of a choice, did they? It's just too hot, too young, too too sudden. And the French government has got to step on it. I think it's a matter. Remember, I always said to you that I really do think sport has got a responsibility to lead by example in terms of not sulking, be, uh, of being happy. We're there to promote a fun, positive, huge experience. But also they got to lead by example by saying the week when they announce how bad this variant is in England, you're not going to have... Uh, you know, rugby games where, where 45 guys travel all the time, where nobody's in exactly. a bubble and nobody's in a bubble. Exactly. And so the weird thing with rugby is you've got this task of inspiring people and entertaining people and having fun and keeping it turning and being on TV and giving some people to watch. But then ultimately, you just said it, you've got a traveling band of 50 people who, if it's picked up in a game with one scrum, one mall, they go back home, they see their wives, they see their kids, they all go to the shops, they all go to supermarkets, they all go to school and it just spreads like wildfire. So... As much as, yes, we love to see our sport continue, they had no choice. They've got absolutely no choice, especially with the cross-border competition. That's why looking a little bit further ahead, Six Nations, is it going to go ahead? We don't know, but it was the right thing to do. Um, you had to close it down because it, it just spreads like wildfire. And that's it. There's 50 of you traveling. It, just, it goes exponentially. So yeah. absolutely the right thing to do. The one good thing you have to say, in contrast to Premiership Rugby, the one thing that I have enjoyed with top 14 is that they've said, let's use these two weeks now. They've acted quickly. Let's catch up on games. 
Why do you think that is? Why why do you think they've been able to do that? Whereas the Premiership have, have, uh, uh, by all accounts, the Premiership clubs have not all bought into that. So have the top 14 clubs all bought in? Well, I I think actually, I don't know. Do you know know why, Tim, why the Premiership said no? Not so much why the French said yes. Exactly. Why did the Premiership rugby say no? I mean, that... because in in the Premiership, all of the clubs have to have to agree to it. So we had uh, Rob Baxter, Pat Lamb, uh, Lee Blackett. Their three have came out and said they'd really like to do it. But then Worcester have have kind of said or inferred that they didn't. And and if you haven't got buy-in from all of them, they they haven't been able to do it basically. And why would you not be buying in? So you got to say so. Buy on, for instance. I take them as the example. They were part of the group that. They caught that strain. They now need anything they can in the coffers and to play these games and to play their home games and get points on the board. So they're not like they're not fussed about European rugby. And I would think looking across the water, Worcester would be in the same boat. So what's the difference? Why do Worcester not need the points and they don't want to get up that premiership? Whereas Bayonne are desperate to get top 14 games played and get points banked. That's why I don't understand. Yeah. I think I agree completely with Pat Lamb. With Baxter, they all came out in the press. I thought that was great. Um, and I cannot see a reason, um, apart from being underhand or not wanting to play games or wanting to pick up free points is the only thing that I can think of. Um, but no, I think it's great. Top 14's back on. Games are back on. They're taking place. People are staying fit, which again leads to less injuries because you're chucking people into games after three weeks off and training in little bubbles. It's, it's dangerous. So no, credit to Top there's 14. Also, back there's on. also, Johnny, um, a little something that brings us back to our ongoing theme about French rugby which is the politics behind it is that let's not be fooled exactly like you said Bayonne uh, their priority is not here but the priority is, is to win every single game uh, because what you have to understand is what when when the game gets postponed and their club gets shut the boys can't play how how far how quick so sorry do you lose match fitness by staying in your house and you know jumping on the rowing machine whilst doing puzzles with your kids it's pretty quick, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> Give me three it's, hours. It's, 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 <laughs> exactly. So, so that's that's complicated. So, even though if like let's say, oh, you can, you're allowed to play next week, yeah, fantastic. But that means they're not going to be the full Bayonne side. And like you said, they need absolutely everything to stay up to keep their project going and all that. No problem. And- um, but there are also the politics behind it is that so world the world of rugby is going to be transformed in the next couple of seasons, right? I mean, we've sort of addressed it from time to time. The uh, in, to, uh, you know, the private equity investments. Um, and I, I just saw that there, there's apparently another private equity company that's going to take 15% of the ABs. You know, a shit ton of money is going to be chucked For into huge world money. Huge, huge money. I think it was $1.3 billion valuation yep. and they're taking 15%. Boom, fa. And, um, and so basically it's like, you, you've got, you know that something's going to change and there's not too many dates. And from the start, what I've told you is that top 14 are like, oh yeah, when they talked about, you know, uh, aligning the calendars, if they want to touch the top 14, it's going to be war. Well, this is precisely the same thing. They basically see it as, is Europe or is us? So Europe has changed a tiny bit. They've, they've, they got, because of that new formula, basically there's one feature less, right? But now they're saying it's Europe or it's us. So the reason why they want to jam pack this, this top 14 is that imagine we get to the end of the season at the speed at which it's going, there's going to be what, 12 games to replay. I think Montpellier three games late, a lot of teams, are, or maybe not 12 games, let's say, some teams might have six games that they need to play. How the hell do you decide to say, you know, out of those six games, do you deserve to win, to lose, by bonus, not by bonus, whatever? So you can pretty much decide who's going to be qualified or not in the little boardroom by deciding do you allocate points or not. And they don't want to get there because then the broadcaster might be like, oh, listen, I paid 100 million for 100 games. But now that there was actually 25 little games that were decided by all schmucks in, in a, you know, in a, in, around the desk by deciding, oh, this guy won by 25 points with a bonus point. So it's a, it's a tough, tough one. The last thing they want is to end up in this. So they're like, let's get rid of Europe and let's please, let's at least use those two weekends to, uh, to do it and to, to, to get some top 14 games in. So it's also, it's, it's, it's back to when things are shit. It's back to a little bit of self-isolation of looking only at your front door. Self-preservation. You know? Absolutely. And they're yeah. like, but <clears throat> what, what pisses me off is that it goes back to the same thing that they're not even allowing a little bit of change. You know, uh, Europe are not perfect. They're far from being perfect. And let, we need to address this whole Toulon Scarlets thing, which at the time I wasn't so much, I didn't really know what was going on and actually felt bad for everyone because I wanted the game to happen. But I can't believe that the EPCR guy, the French guy, Vincent Gaillard, then came out saying, the game was clean, the game was clean, I can't believe they did this. And then you actually go into the details, 
some Toulon boys rock up uh, at the stadium and some Welsh guys are telling us, oh, mate, yeah, we've got seven cases. It's not great. Mental. And then, and then they're going to be forced to play. And, three, and that's five days before Christmas, right? Or something like that. You have, to, you have to think about the guys as being human beings. If you're going to have the chance to spend Christmas with, well, it's not the case in England, you, you know, but in France, if you have the chance to spend with your in-laws or with your parents or this and that, the last thing, I don't care about catching it, but the last thing I want in the world is to give it to somebody who's vulnerable. You know, so you got to think about them. You got to be like, all right. And then when they dig even deeper, you realize they got tested once during that week. That's it. You compare it to the Bayonne case. Oh, listen, the, imagine if we apply the same formula. Um, Leicester, listen, yeah, the variant is really tough. Let's test them all on Monday. We'll see. On Monday, correct me if I'm wrong, Johnny, but I think they had one positive. On Wednesday, they had seven. And by the Friday, they had nine because they almost went to play in cast that weekend. But they got retested three times that week. And on the Friday, they had nine. And that's when they called it off. Like, listen, we're going to contaminate everyone. We're going to press pause and off with team if we keep on going. So that's what really pissed me off about this whole thing is literally like we've said it from the start, right? Everybody needs to get tested all the time. On the on the politics in France, though, obviously there is a timing issue because it wasn't announced until Monday afternoon. So first of all, could it have been done earlier? I know things are fast developing, but but could it have been done sooner than sort of four days before a team was supposed to play on the Friday? And then you mentioned it. Obviously, it came from the French government, but then you mentioned the clubs having different motivating factors. How involved yeah. were the clubs in this? Did it come just from the government or was there a, an aspect of, of the clubs being involved as well? So I don't know how linked it is, but I know that 100%, for instance, like Philippe Tayeb, who's a special character at the best of times, the president of Bayonne, he had no interest in this European stuff going ahead. They don't have any interest. So they've been pushing and leaning on top 14 LNR. And then obviously it's caught wind and it's come, the government side is coming and backed them. But there's like we talked about, there's different agendas. Half of the clubs in the top 14 don't want to play European Cup. They have no interest. The Challenge Cup, they have absolutely no interest. Conversely, teams like Clermont, Benji, you know, fine well, Racing, they'll be desperate to play. So I think half the clubs are going to be over the moon. The other clubs are going to be really disappointed, but it's come from both directions. There's absolutely one half the clubs that have got no interest and have pushed straight from the get-go to get these games off. So I'd say both. And to answer your question, could it have been done sooner? Potentially, but I think like everybody's learning, like it's a process. I think we'd see in the UK, we see in France, we see globally, week by week, things are changing, changing restrictions are getting tougher in different countries. The UK now is completely different. Like France is completely free. We can do pretty much whatever we want. That's not to say that the second strain isn't going to arrive and things are going to change, but I think governments, governing bodies are moving week by week and learning and honestly flying by the seat of their pants. I don't know if you think yeah. any differently, but they don't know any better than us and everybody's just trying to do the best job they can, but it's, it's just unprecedented weird times. But I do think it's great that they've got the top 14 games back on, whereas premiership rugby haven't done that. I, I totally agree with you, Johnny, but just to answer your question, Tim. So basically what happened is that after that Bayon Leicester incident, like, like Johnny said, Tayeb was absolutely fuming because what people need to understand, it, it, it wasn't just a game that got canceled. The whole club was forced to shut Right, the, the whole Bayonne rugby, professional rugby entity was forced to lock the door and, you know, to put a seal on it and be like, you guys stay home, do not move. Where, like Johnny said, in France, people are allowed to, with restrictions, with a curfew, with being careful and stuff, they're still allowed to live. They were completely shut, even the, the back office and everyone, you know, like the whole entity. And, um, and so he got really, really pissed off about this, considering that it was a bit but given put on him. And like Johnny said, because they don't, re it's not their priority and they clearly want to survive in top 14 first. He said, if things stay like this, I am not, even if we reopen in January, I am not playing the European Cup anymore. Stade Francais pretty much said the same thing. So this yeah. kicked up a massive fuss. Then there was a meeting, just the, the uh, EPCR and the league. They pretty much agreed actually to up that the testing policy of the EPCR to what is done in France. So basically three times a week. You do it, on, sorry, it's twice a week if everything's okay, three times a week if there's a problem. So it's on the Monday, just after the game, and then test it again on the Wednesday, or is it 48 hours before the game? Or I can't remember what it is. Like 70 and then, so yeah. once that's done, yeah, so once that's done, that basically sparkled a little interest from, from somebody else. But what happened for this time, which is completely different, it's the first time, it's the Minister of Sport of France who said, not rugby in general, they just said, 
uh, European traveling or you know any yeah, uh, sporting event, yeah. any sport, any sporting event against uh, particularly uh, the United Kingdom uh, teams has to stop. That's what they say. So it's the first time that it's the government who's basically leaning in and be like, listen, and that's why everybody then was like, oh, it's no more of the politics or, oh, it's the league. I'm the federation. No, I'm EPCR. I, it's me. It's me. I've got bigger balls than you do. No, no, no. It's, it's the minister of sport who rocked up. He's like, listen, this is much bigger than everything else. And let's stop. And I think what saves the Six Nations is that the first game is Italy, France, right? Or France, Italy. Yeah. So there's no traveling into the UK. And that the second game, then will be a home game for France or I can't remember what it is, but so there's there's no more there, there's not um, there's no traveling to England or to Ireland until the Ireland France game, uh, which is then will be end of Feb or something. So that's the only thing is giving a few weeks of breathing space to then figure out what's going on. But so that's the reason why to answer your question, Tim, it could have not been done before. It's because it's the first time the Minister of Sport rocks up. Is like, listen, let's press pause now. We decide, and 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 that's how it's going to be. And the top 14 is back. You mentioned it, Johnny. And there's been a bit of news, hasn't there? So um, you predicted it on this show a while back. Xavier Garbajosa, he's gone from Montpellier. He is, mate. But the, the writing was on the wall for so long. Um, from murmurs within the club, from people that worked with him and results, they were just, I don't know, they were dreadful. For so long, when you think about the raw ingredients and what they've got, their team... Arthur Vincent, Andre Pollard, who's injured just now, Louis Picamol. They've got one of the best squads in the top 14, and it just hasn't clicked. So called it a while ago, but not surprised. Um, and being replaced, obviously, with Philippe Saint-André. I mean, you've worked with him, Benji. I don't know if he's the best guy to come in and um, do the on-field stuff in terms of actual coaching. And no, I didn't think so either. Um, so it's a strange one for Montpellier. And I just feel as well, there's been so many coaches come through the doors um, and try to change things. I feel like so many people have persuaded Moed Altrad that they could be the person to take the club to the next level, but it's just never happened. Um, and yeah, really, it's just strange. It's a strange club, strange times. It, it takes all the boxes, should be wonderful, um, but it just hasn't worked. So be interested to get our guest on and catch his thoughts on it because he's much closer to it than we are. You teed it up nicely, Johnny. Uh, our guest should be able to give us a little bit of insight into the situation in Montpellier, hopefully. So let's get him on now. It's former Montpellier coach and Scotland and British and Irish Lions second row. Nathan Hines joins us. How are you? Very well, gents. How are we? We're good. We're good. So just, just fill us in. Where are you now? Where are you living? What are you up to? I'm in beautiful Cheshire. Well, not so beautiful. I went for one this morning. It was hosing down, but that's uh, pretty much every day. Um, so my family and I are here, uh, locked down, homeschooling, Zooming, like, like everyone else. So just adapting to everything, but uh, happy to be back in the UK. The kids are happy to be back at an English speaking school. And um, so it's all good. You mentioned you went for a run. Has, uh, has Johnny got you signed up for um, Doddy Aid, putting the miles in? Uh, Johnny tried to recruit me, but there's no <laughs> way I'm joining his team. We're in Team <laughs> South. We're in Team South obviously, because I'm from Gala. Mate, you're the <laughs> biggest nomad I've ever met. You're 100% Team Exile. There's nobody more well, Team Exile than you. Mate, when I first came to Scotland, I was at Gala, and they embraced me, and I, and I embraced the culture, and, and I, 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 I couldn't <laughs> join any other team. It couldn't be anything to do with the fact that you've seen the stats as well, Nathan, and you realise that Johnny's team is lagging behind quite a bit. Well, Johnny knows me uh, as a player and a coach, and um, I've never looked at a stat in my life. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, Team South uh, to support, uh, to, not just to support Dottie, but yeah, I think uh, uh, Jim and, and Johnny are on the Exile team as well. Are you on the Exile team, Johnny? You are, aren't you? Yep. yep. Yeah. Why head head of recruitment, team? no less. Head of recruitment. I know, I but, <laughs> but why, why aren't you in the Glasgow team? Are you ashamed of that? <laughs> no, not at all. I'll always be part of Glasgow, but I think right now my current situation, Nathan, um, very, very much in exile. Plus, I think they were absolutely bombing and they were trying to drag in anyone they could. Um, and that was it. They were happy to have me. So but That was the reason why you tried to recruit me. You're, you're bombing and you tried to recruit anyone you could. Man, I'm no? just trying to help a struggling ship. And in the end, we're raising money for fantastic charity, so it shouldn't matter. Exactly. I don't know why exactly. we're fighting. No, we're not. I've never... I, <laughs> 
we're, we're not fighting really, are we? We're just bickering like uh, like brothers, like brothers, aren't we? Like teammates. Nothing's changed. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm in Team South also, Nathan. Oh, yeah, you're just confused. By, you're confused got, as what you I are. Got, hang on, let me let me finish because I got recruited <laughs> by Rory Lawson. So I don't care about where we are. I think we're all, you know, brothers of humanity. And, and so yeah. when, when he asked me to do it, I joined him because I know he's going to run 15 miles a day so I can do my 500 yards and I'll feel like chip in. <laughs> the shots. You know, and it's <laughs> all good. Yeah, it's right, I count the, the steps going up and down, going up and down to grab a coffee from this uh, two, two level, two story high house. I think that's, uh, I should get a star for that. I completely yeah. agree that we're all doing a great job, Johnny, but it doesn't say a lot for your title as head of recruitment that neither Nathan or Benji are on your team. <laughs> They'd already signed up, mate. It's a lost cause. It's a lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, speaking of recruitment, before we got you on, Nathan, we were talking about Montpellier and Xavier Garbajosa leaving the club. And obviously you were there and you overlapped with him slightly. So just give us your take on, on the situation. Uh, I mean, it was not surprising seeing the results that they had. So um, it was a bit of a bit of an awkward, really, because... Uh, he was recruited with uh, Pepe Lafon, who came in at the same time. Pepe left the club as well uh, two months ago. And just, I think, after a string of bad results and um, the president, Ultrad, just uh, decided that the only thing he could do was to to let um, Xavier go. Now take us back a step, because obviously you arrived at the same time as Vern. Um, mm -hmm. You finished top at the top 14. You lost the final against Cast. You were absolutely flying. You pretty much won every game at home. You were killing it. Go back to before Garbajosa. Why was Vern let go? Uh, well, it's a, it's a it's, yeah, it's a long story which starts. So you, you you're correct. Yeah, we killed it in year one. Uh, most trials, I think, in top fourteen, and we won our, all, all our home games. Got to the final. Uh, crap the bed. And uh, cast beat us, and and Benji, we we know about cast how they can just lip their way to the, the final, and like they beat us at home. My last game at, at Claremont, uh, they beat us at home in the barrage, which was uh, the only time I lost at Master Michelin. And uh, that was the, the the game where we lost the record of seventy seven home consecutive home wins at Master Michelin. They're the team to do it. Yeah, that was it, and we were absolutely poo that day. And that yeah. They were actually they were really pretty as well, but we were just worse. Um, but they just know how to play finals footy, and, and that's what they did against us. They barred up and smashed us. So, um, so in that second season, before the season started, uh, we had so cast their first game year two after beat, losing to them in the final. It's everyone, you know, it's Canal Plus's dream to have the the finalists play, and uh, the president has a presentation for us on the Thursday, basically asked us why we lost the game the year before oh. against Cast. So first home game of the of the, the season after we lost the final against the team we lost the final two, and the president says, uh, lads, what's what's going on here? Why are you so rubbish? And then uh, obviously we lost against Cast <laughs> at home in game one. And then uh, I think we, we weren't going too well and what the catalyst was for the president, I think, was that we played a game against Perpignan uh, at home. Uh, Perpignan had won a game because they got promoted in the top 14. Right. They hadn't won a game all year and uh, they beat us, which is obviously a, a, an amazing place to be as a coach. <laughs> as an assistant coach, you just sat well, back yeah. a little bit like, oh. No, not really. I mean, because the scrum got pumped. <laughs> so, and, uh, and the, the, the boys were looking. We had a meeting in the change room after the president was there. And he's like, guys, what, what, what's going on? And then I think that was a little bit too much for, for the president. But in the background, I think the president is, you know, he has got a lot of cash, obviously. And he's got all his advisors and he listens to people. And I just think that um, he knows a lot about business, but takes advice about rugby. And I don't know how or why, but he just lost faith in, yeah, in Vern, I suppose, or just starting the ball rolling and seeing if he could bring someone else to help uh, steady the ship, whether that was it, someone that's given that advice um, or not. Like I'm, I, I don't know. 
but uh, he's, he's pretty impatient, the president, so he, he wants results quickly. And I think that's been a bit of a problem for Montpellier. You know, you play there, Johnny, you know. So he wants to he wants to win the championship and he wants to win it pretty quickly. But I think that was the catalyst. So we were ninth, I think. And we played Perpignan, and that would have been February. Um, the Prez got the ball rolling on finding a replacement for uh, bring someone in. I don't think it was to replace Vern, but make Vern in his head director of rugby, bring someone in. Um, he turned out to be Xavier. But what, what happened in the meantime between that game and uh, that game and the end of the season is that we went on a really good winning streak. Um, where we finished, I think we finished 11 wins from 13 remaining games and we finished on the last day beating Claremont at home, well, Claremont in, in Claremont, uh, which we, we were the only team that used to do it. Um, and Cast lost at home that day. So we we went and played a barrage at Leon. We Subsequently, we got pumped. <laughs> we, had not, we had nothing in the tank. Basically, we were playing a final every week for the last three months. So three or four months. But, you know, I think after a difficult start of the season, we managed to pull it back. And I'm pretty sure the president didn't think that we were capable or players were capable of doing it. And we did. So obviously it's too late to, to pull out. Uh, Xavier was, was brought in with a, 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 he was a forwards coach. I mean, obviously uh, there was a year left to go. Um, and he brought in uh, Pepe Lafont and, and Xavier came in year, year three. So that was the that's a pretext to that, John O'Neill. Is that a, mate? Is comprehensive. That fill, fill, in, fill in some blanks. Yeah, but I, I love like obviously I've been there as well. And what I get with Moed is you've obviously got this man with incredible wealth, an incredible amount of business ability, acumen, uh, get up and go and start. He's a lovely bloke as well. Yeah, but. You, you can't be let in a room to talk about rugby. Like he did it two or three times when I was there and you just want to, you know, no, just stop him. Somebody, I know he's the president, but just somebody stop him getting in the room because he just kills it. He flattens everything. He's got no idea of rugby culture or how to talk or rugby people. And it's horrendous. Um, and I don't know, just everything at Montpellier, it could be one of the best clubs in Europe. Yeah, no doubt. It's got I mean, everything to, to draw oh, people to it. Um, it's yeah. got wealth. It's got a fantastic stadium. It's a beautiful place to live. It's got the beach. But just, I don't know, you get there and it's just the infrastructure or there's an off vibe or you feel like there's something dubious or underhand going on and you never quite get your finger on it. And then obviously you have every two years, somebody come in and try and pull the wool over Moed's eyes and make him believe that he is the Messiah and he can win the top 14. And it just yeah. is a constant circle and a nasty That's cycle. That's the thing. That's the thing. I mean, I, I think if he uh, just settled on a, a coach or a, coach or a staff that could uh, have some sort of continuity and, and you know make it that um, the players, but the, the players. <laughs> so what you're saying, people aren't aren't safe there really, because uh, before even but when I left the SA Scotland, Vern and I got there early. Uh, Alex King and Ian Vass were, they came a little bit later. So we watched the barrage for uh, the year, the previous year. They're racing at home, they got beat in the barrage. Um, but what had happened as well, there were some players that we that, were, that we didn't want in our squad. The GIF quota was changing, um, the salary cap and all that. So we knew there was players that were, that were leaving the president had told them. No one had told them. So they had... Oh, I know this story. This is awesome. Yeah. Go, I got yeah. This is right, great. Mate, it's, not, it's not awesome if you're a player, mate. And it's not awesome if you're a coach coming in. So no one knew Barrage uh, against Racing. No one knew anything about the, the next year. The president didn't want to tell them. I don't know if Jake White wanted to tell them if it was his, uh, it's his decision, which yeah, it does make a difference, really. Uh, so... <laughs> We watched the barrage on the Saturday, on well, Saturday, and then the president said, "We're going to have a meeting on Monday afternoon to introduce you, you and Nathan to to the team uh, before they go on holiday." Um, we didn't know that none of the players that weren't going to be there the next year hadn't been told yet. 
So the place had a barbecue organized for the, the Monday and it got out in the press about players leaving or being uh, let out of the contracts. And some of the players were, were looking, were having, having food and they were looking at the phones going, mate, what, what's going on here? And then they're going on. And then they got a tap on the shoulder from the director general at the time and said, oh, can we have a chat? So obviously it, just, it sort of blew up then that the players found in the press that they were being let go. And um, like, like you're saying, Johnny, it just has no, I mean, rugby, there's a, you know, there's feeling in rugby, you know, there's managing people and, and, where most the most people you know, have that respect where you, you know I may, you know, I'm honest honestly you tell me how it is and then we can get over it but mate that was that was quite tough so I remember uh, getting to the stadium I think it would have been about three o'clock I see boys living in their cars and and then it, basically the shit hit the fan and then the president had a meeting with the players and um, is Vern and I there he's introducing us and how the, one of the most awkward meetings I've ever been in my life where guys have just been told to guys who've just been told to, to, to leave that they're, they're not coming back to the club and then not knowing this months in advance where they could find a club. They've just been told boys, you're not coming back. The remaining players are really annoyed that uh, they've been told the way they have been and they're pissed off with the president and the president goes, okay, boys. So uh, that's happened. We'll move on next year. He's these two coaches. I want to talk to you. Oh, so it was, it was awkward. It was really awkward. But that's but, yeah, the lack that's of, the of empathy. The lack of empathy. It, so, like, so, so rugby everywhere in the world, rugby talks about values, culture, a sort of unwritten code, trust that we have with each other, and that is just that's one of the things that we haven't gone into yet in the podcast. Benji, I can see your head in your hands. You're gonna love this. <laughs> but it's one thing that in other parts of the world is slightly more respected, or there's a bit more respect for players, whereas because it's so business-like, because it's presidents that have big companies and they're very much used to, how can you say this, almost transactional leadership. Well, I pay this guy off, yeah, he gets his payout, it. he should be sweet. But that's not the way it is. Yeah. There's an effect and there's an emotions behind these things that have a ripple effect and a butterfly effect on everyone in the squad, their feeling, the vibe, and then how that club is viewed by all other teams. And that's it. Montpellier is just one of those teams for one reason or another. And there's a few of them in France that has that and it's that for me it's transactional leadership oh you know i've paid him off in june like he's going to get his full year contract he should be happy mate no he's got a wife he's got three kids they have a house that they bought here they're happy yes then i find the club or continue playing as like antoine batut's a good example he was one of the blokes yeah. wife two kids has to find a club and find a team and a job in three months otherwise he's forcibly retired effectively because you can't find a team and who wants a bloke that hasn't played for you and it's just mental like benji i want to chuck this to you because i can see you're gagging to get in no, cool, it's, it's, we, we spoke we spoke we spoke about marvin o'connor already remember he got sacked three times <laughs> yes. at three consecutive <laughs> clubs and he got yeah, three three-year three deals yeah. and the, the big, richest the big man answer from all those more del trad is like why are you going to complain i just wrote you a check for 150 grand 200 grand whatever it is you know dry mm -hmm. your eyes and move on well, it, I know this is fun and Heinze, you were in the middle of it. And I'm sure at the time you were not laughing at all because that is heartbreaking shit. But it yeah. really, really pisses me off to hear that again and again, because how long ago? That was three years ago, right? When, when Vern that was, was three there and years ago, that. yeah. And he's just repeatedly, repeatedly. And he's the same guy that was in a lawsuit with Fabian Galtier for two and a half years and ended up paying yeah. it off for a couple and of And then Jake White yeah. and like and never ending. Well, J Jake White should have never been there, in my, my opinion, but that's just, just my, my opinion. <laughs> but the, basically, it's just, what pisses me off is that it's repeatedly the same thing, you know? And it's really, it's, this is crushing my soul in, in terms of, what, and exactly like you said, beautiful place. Um, beaut there's a huge academy that you forgot to mention that brings yep. some fantastic players out that are really, really good. There's a really, uh, how do you say, it? the... the a very right. proud region around right. uh, around around the, the club and the values that it gives and stuff and there's a really strong legacy you know from the past of this cool club that came back from i mean the louis picamol era of those guys that came from second division the fufu and drago and all that yeah. and brought this club back to where it should be then you bring one of the biggest french businessmen uh success of the last decade who should be there, not only because he's got a lot of cash, obviously, but he definitely knows a few things about business, right? You can't take that away from him. But then when a guy like that can make so many mistakes repetitively, again, then, I mean, don't get me into launch into this, but uh, dips his fingers with the Federation in the most dodgy way you could possibly think. You know, that <laughs> really puts, put, uh, allegedly, obviously. But um, 
but you know and, and and really puts i don't think these guys realize the, the shadow that it puts on the whole of french rugby it's not just montpellier it just it just makes us look like idiot because you make you make the players um only be um money driven because you're like oh listen if they didn't kick mo much more of a storm and actually burn the club down that means all they care is about their welfare yes but when you turn around and your missus is like oh what are we doing next year and she's mortified then you pull the check out. Yeah, listen, we'll be all right for a couple of months. Don't worry. You, you know, we can sort the kids out. It's not we're not jumping off a cliff right now. And that's you, you got to know that the guys have got to take care of their own ones. Right. Then then you've got you got you got Heinze. You're going to be like, oh, but they let go. They let go. Vern, how could you possibly do that? But you're in the same you're in the same wheel. you got to work. you got to keep on going. You, we got to make out of the best out of a shitty situation. So basically, I think really do think it's like you let the wolf into the the den or i don't know how you say that you know yep. le, le, le parc aux and then and and we're just letting, letting those Parcos mistakes Agneaux. be done <laughs> you, <laughs> you know you just let yeah, you just let those the, those mistakes being field. repeated yeah. all and all and all the time and i mean that, listen Heinz, it, i played with you in clermont we had a great yeah. time and Vern was there but you, and we were not perfect in clermont by a mile no. not, not no. by a mile but at least you could walk in and speak to Vern. You could walk in and speak to the president at the time. You could speak to Jean-Marc Larmé, I think it was at the time. And you knew you were going to have an honest answer, right? You knew there yep. wasn't going to be any backstabbing about, listen, you know, shut your mouth now. We forget about who you are. We forget about how many kids you've got. We forget about what you've done in your life. And we're just going to chuck you out the window. There was, it's not perfect at all. But there's a tiny bit more respect that actually makes me feel a little bit more warm inside about recommending rugby to other people. Recommending, yep. I mean, you've got son. Uh, you know recommending them to go play in Montpellier in 10 years time right now you're like well stay stay somewhere Mate. else you know well it's a couple of things Benji like I think for 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 rugby players as well you, you can't be half in you can't be half into to playing it's the sports hard enough as it is right so if constantly you feel like you've got a red dot on you you're not going to invest yourself emotionally or physically in, into into your club you know like we've had I mean the president brought in um uh, Johan Goosen, who's he's a good, good bloke, but we had to get through. We had to get rid of two players to fit him in the salary cap. Two players that were that we wanted to keep because they're really good for the squad, you know. But obviously, we're forced to do that because the president listened, had some advice, and brought him in, or, or even you know, that's a whole other story about about Goose and racing ninety two. Get into so. it. That's a great one. Come on, <laughs> yeah, give us the depth well, on that one because everyone really wants to know. I don't know the story of that one, mate. Oh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't actually know. I don't know the story. That one that was uh, done. I think that would have been done before we. Well, it would have been done before we were there. But the funny thing is, a bit of a story is uh, on that when we played Racing ninety two. Uh, my so third year we played start of the season in my third year. Um, they welcome in the, in the change room. They welcome back former uh, racing players, and Goose's name wasn't on there. So, uh, well, obviously, I wrote it up because that, that was quite rude. But, um, yeah. I, they don't, You're so not, awkward, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. It's just me, mate, you know. I know. Um, I know. Just be a pain in the neck. And then, um, yeah, so obviously, that's, they're still a little bit sore about that. But going back to you, the – so the emotional security thing is as well. Like, I think that's a problem. If you can keep re repeating the cycle, Benji, like you're saying – um, about, you know, you get a coach in, you get rid of him, you get another coach in. Jake White, it came in. Well, funnily enough, you talk about academy, he decimated the academy at Montpellier. We got there and there was like zero, there was no players whatsoever. All the good players from Montpellier playing all the clubs in top 14 now. And they're, and they're amazing. And he came in, he brought in South Africans to, to bump up. Oh, that was a different time with the salary cap and the GIF, uh, which caught up to us when we started. Um, and I, I it just like you say, it's a great place. It could be an amazing club, but no one invests themselves fully because they're just fearful of that transactional leadership saying, well, I paid you for this. You do this. If you don't do it, then leave. So then I got a question because you say it obviously impacts the players. And that was, that was going to be my initial question. But Johan Gusen, to sum up the situation, was a racing player, decided mm -hmm. to do the dodgiest thing possible, fly back to South Africa, pretend that I'm reti retiring from professional rugby, whatever, to get out of a long-term deal to sign somewhere else, yeah? Even Bujelal and Lorenzetti, who are not the cleanest blokes in the world, said the club who will sign Yuan Gusen is led by a thief, is led by a mob, 
you know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you see Montpellier, boom, 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 <laughs> coming through. And, and they signed him. And how did they do it? I think they may, must have paid him in Safa for a while and yeah. then get him to come back. Whatever they did, like you said, that's that's mm. like that will be part of, the, of, of, a, of a good book in a couple of seasons. But And they got him back. But that's the impact that it's got, like you said, to shine back onto, onto the, the lack of trust in the whole organization. <clears throat> because, you know, if you're part of the club that does that, you're like, oh, shit, it's us again. If you know that the president comes up a statement saying Nathan Heiss has got nothing to worry about his job, you know, he'll be fine. And three weeks later, he's sacked. That's what he did to Garbajosa, right? After the, he did, the he did fourth coach got well. sacked. He did, he did the same thing to Werner. So that VC, yeah. you cannot trust. So my question is, does, there's zero trust from the players to the president. For sure. So, like you said, they're uh, le cul entre deux chaises, the, the ass between yeah. two seats. They don't know where they're yep. going. You know, they're a bit, they're a bit scared, and obviously that impacts uh, their their fully full commitment to the team, to give your soul and your passion, and your heart every week in week out for sure. But does it also shine on you guys as as a management as a coaching squad, because you're basically the link between the president and the players, right? Does that prevent uh, from the players to actually trusting in in trusting the the coaching setup? Because because they were above or not? Because let's face it, no. Montpellier has always been a tough place to play, right? It's not been about physicality. Physicality has never been the problem. But you could just tell that there was just that little bit of thing that wasn't clicking, apart from what you mentioned, that last stretch of season where you end up beating Mont, uh, Clermont in Clermont for my last game in Clermont, thank you very much. And then you, you lost yeah. in the barrage against Lyon. And you, had conse- you needed like consecutive wins just, just, just to fit in. And I remember Mohamed Dawas, the, the French prop, Scoring a try at 81st minute against that Francais who got you a bonus Stephen point. Oh, yeah, mate. like it was, it was incredible. Was they, they were out. Was ridiculous story. And then there's yeah. a kickoff and he picks it up and he scores last minute. And then you get that bonus point that allows you to score. So that's when I felt there was a bit of glue in, in, yep. in, in that squad. And so my question is, does that lack of glue, is it impacted? Is the relationship coaching players, is it, is it as impacted as uh, president players? No, I think what, what Vern did really, really well is he served as a barrier between uh, the president and the players. He, he, he said, look, boys, we are, we, we're rugby. The president is the president. So we have to look after one thing and that's us. And whatever happens outside is what happens outside. We can't do it. So, and he, Vern, uh, even as, as a coaching group, Vern absorbed a lot of shit from the prayers that we didn't even know about. So he did a lot of work just being that buffer between um, everyone. But I think the reason why we came back like that is because we, as a, as a, as a group playing and coaching group, we were quite, um, you know, we respected each other and we knew that we, um, there was a good relationship between us. I mean, it was, it was brutal at times and, and, and always honest, as you know, Benji being coached and, and Beats being coached by Vern. But I think that the investment the players had with us was uh, was different than how they feel with um, with the Perez. How is Vern? Uh, mate, he's in New Zealand. He's in COVID New Free New Zealand on the farm. So, mate, he's he's amazing. I get a text Can you actually now see Vern coaching Fiji? I think either he's going to have a heart attack, either he's <laughs> going to kill one of them, but something's going to happen. Or, sorry, or he might be the first coach to actually transform them into a hell of a side, a competing so. side. Yeah. So it could be a bit of everything. I think um, he's changed a lot since he first came to Mont- uh, to Claremont, uh, Benji. Um, but still very intense. And I think the the good thing about VC as well, he understands the culture of where he, go, where he goes. So he... He learns a lot. He likes to read and be informed about you know, the culture of Claremont or Scottish um, history, Scottish culture, the, the Montpellier and Fiji. Obviously, Fiji's got a massive culture. So um, I think he un- he makes a real effort to understand the people that he coaches. Um, and I think it's good for him as well that it's international. So it's not week on week on week on week on week. Um, but he loves coaching. And I, th- and, uh, I had... I was part of the coaching group in the, on the uh, successful Barbas tour. Uh, <laughs> I was going to bring that up, yeah. No losses. No losses. At some point, yeah. at some point if you're part of the, the, the shit every time, Wagga, you got to look at yourself, mate. I, you gotta, I have. Don't something. worry, Benji. I have. Don't worry. Every day. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's another story. We'll go that later. But um, we have a lot of Fijians group and um, they... Um, 
they're really a pleasure to coach. You know, they're open and they love rugby and they, they're respectful. Um, and, and I think Vern will be really, he'll do really well in engaging with them and, and, and upskilling them and, um, you know, getting them to play decent rugby. So um, I'm happy that he's got the job and that, uh, and that uh, he can still coach, especially after what happened at Montpellier. That's the crap bit is that we talked earlier about players getting careers ended. That is the danger of the volatility. That's probably the biggest single factor that I didn't want to coach was the volatility of coaching staffs and presidents in France. I think if it wasn't for that, I would have quite enjoyed it and given it a stab, but you just couldn't, you couldn't bank on the fact that you couldn't get three months into a job and you'd be sacked and have to move your family again and again and again. And I'd had enough of it during rugby yeah. and didn't want to do it as a coach. Yeah. Um, Mate, no, you, you touched on exactly. something really interesting with Vern. Um, and it's the psychological aspect. Like, I would say he's weird. Like, most people that have been coached by Vern would say he's a weird guy, but he's a good guy. He's a straight guy, but he's a little bit weird. And it's the psychological aspect. I love that. The way he came into Scotland and he'd be like, no, boys, deep. Like, obviously, because it's a tiny, there's like Glasgow, Edinburgh, your little bubble. Your strength is that you know each other. Um, you tap into the fact that you're clans and you know, like, he was really good and adept at mentally getting involved with whatever squad he had and bringing the best out using different different things that's what i loved about Vern. he also nearly broke me though um in that you said psychologically he is tough but psychologically there's different ways of dealing with different people and i remember i think it was my second last six nations game i think he, he did break me actually i think he was the last coach to pick me and he was the last one but we we're in the tunnel he's like oh beats can you come in here and then um, we just have a chat. And he took me into, you know, in the tunnel at Murrayfield, you've got all the names, and everyone's caps. And then there's that little like boot room where the coaches change their boots before you go out and do team run. Uh, it was uh, change room, change room three. That's the one. Like the, yeah. Yeah. So he pulled me in there now, and he I was, think, <laughs> now, now that I think it's a massive change room as if eaten that up. So yeah. And he pulled me, pulled me in there to, this is my second last game, six nations for Vern. He was like, is there any chance you could watch Fritz Lee? And play a bit more like him <laughs> <laughs> and that was it he obviously was so or he wasn't getting what he wanted he was like mate like if you could Parise if you could watch Sergio Parise or Fritz Lee and just try and be a bit more like them in the way you play like I'd, I'd really appreciate it and that, that was it <laughs> two games later I've never seen again thanks for coming Byrne thanks for having me man he absolutely I, he, home, he's mate. definitely got his own management style mate I was speaking to my mum the other day and um I told her about obviously about um, Xavier and 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 stuff, and she said that you know it was good. He, he helped you you know build your confidence. So I said, Mum, Vern didn't help me build my confidence. Vern made me build my own confidence because that's the way he does stuff. <laughs> you know, he um, he he he's you know he's brutally honest and he does it from a place of love um, and well most of the time, but everything he does is what he thinks is, is the best for the team. And, and that's, you know, sometimes it's hard to hear. I mean, brutal. Brutal, brutal mate. Coach, Yeah, coaches' meetings were, were brutal as well. Mate, you think you had tough as a, as a player. That's different different gravy when you're when you're one of his assistants. But the thing is, he just wants you to be better. He, he wants the team to be better. And and that's just the way he does it. So, but like you're going back to the, to the story thing, I think he just tries to tie in tries to make uh, find the identity of the squad, the team, whoever he's coaching, tries to tie it in with the history of where you are. And I think that gives everyone a higher purpose and, and gives everyone in the squad, um, um, you know, a sense of something bigger than themselves. And I've got, I've got videos that my analysts put together when we're with Scotland, just about Scotland, you know, and about being yeah. Scottish. And, and it, make, it makes you cry every time you watch it because you just have that, that feeling and it doesn't matter if it's what video it is or where you are you, that emotional lever is something that Vern's really really good at yeah I may also I was going to say the feeling you got even though he didn't really enjoy me much as a player which I understand you can't be everyone's cup of tea you're not Fritz Lee you don't mark you don't mark Fritz Lee not anyone's cup of tea <laughs> but you 100% got that vibe whereas I would have been really I would have struggled to then have a coffee with them or have a glass of wine, but you two actually became really good mates. Like on and off, if you, like you have a few glasses of red together, like you chill out together. Um, you got on really well. Mate. Yeah, we did. Um, and it wasn't like, 
I don't know. I don't know how it came about, really. Uh, I didn't spend any time outside of rugby with him when I was at Claremont, Benji, apart from uh, um, one time. Oh, after Actually, after the, the cast game, he invited me around to his house and said, mate, uh, where do we go wrong? You know? And that's the other thing I haven't mentioned. Vern's always looking to get better. Like, he wants you to be brutal with him as, as much as... Now that's a different story because you can't be brutal with them, but you've got to. <laughs> 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 but he's always asking. He's always asking, like always reviewing, always saying, "Right, that doesn't work. What can we do?" You know. So even after the, um, even after that cast game, he's like, "Mate, what what did we do wrong? How did I, did do we get the year wrong? Do we have, you know?" But he just wanted some help to, to 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 get better. So that was the only time I really interacted with him, and then, and then. Uh, outside of uh, the stadium. Oh, from every but, Monday morning where you're eating his ass just to, to make sure that you were on the team sheet, right? Well, Apart from that. no, I, th I think he's I think he was just make he was trying to fluff me out, mate, to keep me um, fit so I could play on the weekend. That was, that's the way I remember it. Uh, but Imagine, think, we had second rows. We had Nathan Heist, Jamie Cudmore. <laughs> we had two 52-year-olds in the locks, but, mate, they were hanging in there. So they, they weren't really there Monday, Tuesday, but by Saturday, they were there, and they're properly there. Mate, so you're full of shit. Lucky. I had full of shit. There was a thing called uh, you get the orange card that Vern used to come in. He goes, mate, you want an orange card today? You get your, I know you're old. You don't want to play. You know, and I'm trained do you? And like, I'm like, and obviously, cause he knows that he says anything, like, you can't do that. I'm like, Well, yes, I can. So every, <laughs> I think I missed, I missed two trainings. I missed two trainings, and uh, had a broken, uh, had a broken toe that I had to get an injection for to train because I couldn't walk without it. Um, I had that thing. I had it twice. So that's. But he's like, mate, you, yeah, you can just stay in, mate. Just stay in. You, you, you and Jubon can stay. He does that all the time. I know. He does that all the time. He just, he, he's a poking you, mate. He's poking you, but which works with some people and doesn't and doesn't with others, but definitely worked with me. And uh, I think the other thing beats is that he just knew that I could put up with, not put up with, that's, that's the wrong way to put it, but I was okay with being uh, told straight and, and what he was saying or how he's saying it wasn't aligned sometimes with what he was saying. So I could separate with the, the brutality of what he was saying and, and, and bring it in and say, okay, this is what I need to do. But I think that's why we sort of got on okay. Um, And then, but yeah, we did have a few glasses of wine. We had barbecues and stuff. And and he, he was good at, um, well, we had the staff came around to, to his house and got people together and, and stuff. So he's not he's not as uh, weird as probably you think he is, Beats. <laughs> he's probably he's just, he's just, he didn't want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame him, mate. He's really close him. to Fritz Lee, though. He's yeah. really good mate. With <laughs> I don't blame him either. Yeah. Had him around a couple of times. <laughs> And um, you've no. you've spent most of the last 10 years with him, uh, with Vern Nathan. So has he tried to take you to Fiji or not? No, no, mate. No, he hasn't. So obviously he's, he's learned that I'm a crap at coaching. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I don't do it anymore. Uh, no, he's got some good assistants. So way better than me. Uh, Jason Ryan from the Crusaders. He, he's doing the forwards. Um, and um, and also he's close to home as well. So that makes it easier for him to, to talk to. Um But yeah, he, he hasn't. I've spoken to him. Uh, obviously, on the Fiji, or the uh, Barbarians trip was short as it was. But uh, yeah, nothing, nothing to do with Fiji. How gutting was What? that trip? The Barbarians the trip Barbar and the way it all unfolded and. Oh, mate, it's just disappointing, really, wasn't it? I mean, we all got, uh, we all signed up to the week in the uh, rubbish hotel that we we're staying with and drinking together in, in the team room uh you know we sign up for that and then you know it's just disappointing that players have felt the need to go outside of, of the hotel so uh disappointed for the the guys that the, the fijian guys who the first time out of fiji Mate. they come to london play a game against england and they get and they get told they can't play so that no, was really gutted for them but uh Yeah, it was a bit... The thing is, we were lucky to be able to have that game on, lucky to for these guys to be here. And I, it's just, I think, just, just disappointing is the word, mate. I'm not angry, disappointed. <laughs> One of those dead ones. But yeah, it was... The other thing that really 
um, made it uh, difficult for me to, to, to watch, especially when I saw the, the video on Twitter, is that the boys are having a great time, like having drinking games and stuff. But that would be hotel. awesome if it was in the city. Yeah, but it would have been better if it was in a hotel. You know, like, why couldn't we have done it there? You normally sneak out of the hotel because you want a beer and the coaches don't let you. But when you're on the bar bars and you say, boys, you know, let's get stuck in the beers and have, you know, have, have a have a chat. You know, that's the disappointing thing as well. And you've given us a good insight into what Vern is like as a bloke. Um, presumably, he laid the rules of the bubble out to everyone very clearly. How did he take it? Yeah, he was he was bitterly disappointed, like myself. I mean, he didn't. Uh, the Barbers made it very clear before you turned up the the rules and regulations. And Monday, they got told exactly what was happening. So, um, the night, uh, Vern's an early sleeper, especially he's a bit jet lagged from New Zealand. So, um, I was up when the the security guard told me the boys had been out. So I was like, oh god. So I had to put my poker hand down and. Get up, get, get up from the poker table and sort this out. But um, yeah, so we had to go wake him up and and he thought we were joking at the start because he would never have thought that that would happen either. You know, you put your trust in people um, and you, you think that they'd be able to, to follow through. Yeah, but he's just really bit, bit disappointed. Obviously, we had to try and get 12 players, as it turned out, with 13, but 12 players on the Thursday before the game to replace the 12 that had been out. We managed to do that. And we found out there was another player that, uh, well, there are a few on the, on the Thursday, so they couldn't, on the Friday, so they couldn't do it because it was too much of a risk. But, you know, we had to um, pull it together. And I think that after that effort, the second effort to get everyone back, get the players that had to leave back in was, I think he was just really disappointed that he couldn't um, give the opportunity for the, the guys who, who, uh, manage to stay in hotels and follow the rules. Yeah, we we've uh, we've drifted quite a long way from um, Xavier and Garbage <laughs> there, but um, <laughs> but going going, well, going back to your <laughs> going, <laughs> going back to your relationship with him um, when you left Montpellier, obviously you, you did overlap with him for a while. You've you've spoken publicly about how you know you you weren't compatible as maybe as blokes, but definitely as coaches. Um, so just give us an insight into how it all unfolded with you leaving and, and what your relationship like was like with him. I mean, from the start, uh, we had a camp in Tinia and we drove up. Uh, and look, It's difficult. You want to... So we knew it was a bit of a shit sandwich that um, Xavier and Pepe came, were coming in. We knew we had one year left. We, we knew Vern would be moved upstairs. Well, okay. Well, this is a this is a situation we're in. Let's just let's just do this because you know it might not be that bad. Um, he might be all right, all right, bloke. He might have some good ideas, and and we've done we've done a lot of work in the two previous years. We found out what worked, what what didn't. Um, we knew the players really well, um, and then <clears throat> we went up to Tinia. Uh, I can't I can't remember. They left early, so Pepe and Xavier left early in, in a van. We drove up in vans, the coaches, yeah, and the staff drove up in vans. They took they took one. They stopped off at uh, Grenoble for, for for lunch, which we found out at the end uh, afterwards. And and we got there, and they, and Pepe and Xavier were working on their game plan, and and <laughs> and Vassi, the defence coach, and I turned up. All right, gents, yeah, how are we doing? And like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, good. And then. That was clear from the start that they were like Xavier was trying to piss up piss on his patch, which is fine. But we didn't really include us at the start, saying, "Well, boys, what, 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 if, look, I can't say, but if it was me, I'd go and say, and I'm going into uh, two coaches that are already there. We're sort of a little bit yeah, gun shy because it's a bit of a crappy situation. You'd find out what worked, what didn't, try to make us, you know, bring us on side, manage, manage us as people, and and trying to get the best out of us, knowing that we're probably not going to be there in a year, and he could use that to be better for the team with us. Obviously, it didn't work out that way because he was like working on stuff, and we tried to have a, a team, a, a coaches meeting, and it ended up being that he's tell, they tell us what to, what we're going to be doing, and so it was pretty clear from the outset. And then um, there was not much, yeah, not much bonding going on. I think 
we climb up a mountain in Ting and we come back down. And, and this is the kind of thing, that, you know, we all know about rugby. Like, we do something hard, we have a beer together. Like, whether we're playing on the same team or, or on, on a different team. So we climbed this mountain, which was the team we're going to do. But we send them up in gondolas and the, and the coaches, right? We said, we'll, we'll do it. And uh, came back and went down to the the, the cafe on, on the lake there. Right, boys, let's have a beer, you know. End of, end of a hard day, it's been... And uh, and we all had beers. And I think Xavier had a Carrier and um, Pepe had a Coke. And you're like, oh, okay. And then he told the boys they couldn't go out for a beer after, after at, at training, after training. This is obviously pre-COVID. So that's when you could interact outside your, outside your room. So he said, and I'm like, oh. So it just became awkward right from the start. But, um, and we're like, okay, fine. Like, we could, maybe it's just, um, because he's new and he doesn't really know us and stuff, but it just it didn't really get much better from there. To be fair, but um, such so crap. Yeah, note, mate, note, uh, note to all the coaches out there: if you go to Teen with your with your team, Teen is in the French Alps, right? And there's a fantastic beautiful. setup in the summer to train, fantastic facilities. Uh, when you go, definitely have a few beers. Remember the Clermont season two years ago where they were really shit. Uh, after yeah. I left, obviously. One of the big issues was that oh, they the didn't only have. Shit where you left, mate. They were good when you were there. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they, they basically they 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 had the same issue as that a big yeah. long day. Frank was scared because a lot of leadership uh, had left the team. There was a lot of youth within. It. it was the World Cup year and all that, and uh, and after a big massive week and stuff, there was the, the there was a fet there was a what do you call that like a. First of all, a regional festival. party, or I don't yeah. know, you know how you call that, in um, in, in yeah. Tini every year. And that was in front of their hotel. And the boys were allowed one beer and then go back home. And that created frustration and this and that. Oh, you're not allowed. And, you know, we don't understand. We're not kids. And at the same time, once you train hard, you deserve your treat and all that. So basically, long story short, whenever anybody goes into a camp, if you want to build a team, I'm not saying get absolutely trashed, you know, and, 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 and get absolutely mental, but allow your boys to have a few beers. It's a big part of rugby, right? I think it is a big part of rugby, and and that's yeah. You know, we did it after every game, and beats and 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 plays with Vern after every game. We had a beer together and at least one beer together after a game, um, just because just to reconnect after doing stuff. And I think like Vassy and I, Ian Vass and I, ended up being uh, like we went out that night and had a beer because to get to conversation, to get to relax. Um, like we didn't have to have a beer to talk, but, you know, just get out of the hotel and, and talk about the day. And um, and it was just, it was pretty rubbish, mate, to be fair. And uh, the boys sort of knew it. They knew, they knew pretty quickly that, um, they knew the situation we we're in anyway with new coaches coming in. But that was the, the hard bit for, for us. Well, Bassi ended up going to Northampton in, in November because they he, he fell out with, with uh, Xavier because Xavier tried to change the defence system and obviously or questioning Ian on his defence system and trying to change it where Ian's responsible for the defensive system. So if he, um, but then he, he's had another, another opportunity in Northampton. So he left in November, leaving me on my Todd with, um, with three French coaches, um, which was amazing. And um, pretty much hate in life. <laughs> it ended up being, uh, I didn't, Oh, well, even when Vassi was there, talk about the racing game. They changed the uh, the three coats. So there was um, uh, even that at the time. It was Pepe, uh, Xavier, and Julian Thomas who, who finished playing, and he was sort of assistant coach with us in, in, the, in the second year. Um, and he was sort of gravitated towards the French coaches. They they changed the warm up. Um, they changed the way we did like a, a boost before you know you do pre-match stuff, change all that stuff. Uh, and Vassy and I didn't know. So we turned up at the thing and they're doing all these stuff. I'm like, mate, did you know anything about this? And they're like, no. So they've had a, they had meetings then about changing the, the stuff that we didn't know about. Obviously, I found out that they had selection meetings without me and, and all sorts of stuff. So that <laughs> that sucks. Was, it but was then, pretty good. But pu again, the proof is in the pudding. Obviously, he's been sacked, but his inability to co-work or think of the greater good and his fight to sort of micromanage or control, he's been sacked. So, yeah. do you know what I mean? And the, like the, 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 what the product that he... Again, he came from La Rochelle, where with Patrice Colazzo, they played from, from some fantastic rugby, but none of that shone through at Montpellier. I mean, they were... Uh, sorry, the 
was going to say they're garbage. I can't say that they're garbage also, but the rugby they produced was poo. Um, but, you know, off the back of the way he's been with the coaching staff. So then what transferred onto training pitch was actually the Denling that was seen to be good or perceived as nah. productive from La Rochelle make its way over to Montpellier or was it just something completely nah. clean that he tried to do and nah. just did not work? He didn't work. He, I think he tried to play from everywhere. And we'd, we'd been pretty good at exiting and um, like our scrum wasn't amazing. Our handling, like, um, yeah, scrum wasn't amazing. So if we played any rugby in our own half, we made and drop the ball, we're going to get pumped in scrum. So looking at that, when he came in, he just said, let's just play from everything, everywhere. There's no real detail around stuff. It was pretty much just play. Look, the best way to describe it is to lose 1995 or 2005. That's the way you wanted to play. Offloading, no rucks, um, that kind of stuff. But he just didn't have the team to do it. Um, and rugby sort of changes. We didn't have a scrum to do it. You couldn't, you couldn't dominate in the, in the scrum. We've been hold, uh, have parity in the scrum, especially made errors in the first half. And there's just no strategy to a game. I mean, even like this, going back to the, the game against La Rochelle just a couple of weeks ago where they got beaten, the strategy was to play around them. They played in a hurricane. <laughs> like, <it was> so, <laughs> and that all knew, they knew all week it was going to be wet, windy, it was going to be rubbish. And the, the strategy was play around them. And it's just a mistake. So, um, yeah, I have to go back. I forgot where I was now. But uh, there was nothing that he he did that was anything, anything to do with the game. Arjen, uh, we lost at cast because we didn't have a kicking game in a first game of the year. Uh, and then Arjen out beat us by strategy. They out kicked us. They, they played in our, in our half. And we got caught in a half and got pumped, and that's that shouldn't happen. So, um, and as many times as we tried to help because uh, we wanted the team to win, uh, Vassy and I, and end up being just myself. We, we wanted success, and we didn't really. We could put that personal stuff aside, even though that it's difficult to work with some with people. You try and put that personal stuff aside. Um, that just so we can win. And I think a lot of emotional energy from myself and Vassy was right. We're not, we're getting, we're getting nothing from this part of the coaching team. We've got to the, the playing side and, and not, and be like, sort of like be the buffer between the shit time we're having and still trying to keep them motivated and, and keep them on course to, to perform. So that took up a lot of energy from us, but uh, in the end, yeah, it was, uh, that was pretty poo. I think one of the one of the, the, one of the lowlights for you was, uh, I think it was about three games in, and uh, had a meeting. I think we lost two lineouts on in the attacking twenty-two, and bearing in mind, I think we we're like second or third. Well, our lineout was quite good. Second or third were quite inventive on the line, uh, like going into in score. Uh, I think we lost two lineouts, and that really annoyed him because obviously by the time we get to the the, the five meter line, the line out, we work so hard to get there by not because we played for our own try line that he's expecting us to score a try. So we missed two lineouts in three games. He's like, right, this is shit. Um, um, Nathan, I'm going to get you have to consult with Vern now. Uh, he has you have to, everything you do has to go through him. Uh, bearing in mind that Xavier told Vern he doesn't want anything to do with him because he doesn't want it's, it's his team and he wants him just to stay up in the office and not come back <laughs> so yeah so um and uh so that was interesting dynamic as well he came down with the coaches meetings every, every now and then at the start but then didn't come back at the end but um so he said run everything through Vern. Vern's gonna make all the decisions but but you can still have the pleasure of talking to the players so, so i was like uh, I didn't really know how to react, and then um, I, I let it go. And I was like, "That's just just wrong." So that's just the kind of thing I didn't really enjoy him as a human. I didn't think um, we definitely weren't compatible as coaches, and um, yeah, it was pretty pretty bad time. Pretty to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Oh, actually, sorry, I forgot the bit to ask to say about the Savonnet La Fonche. La Fonche. Yeah. So that's the that's the sorry the disappointing for me the thing that the president said about that the assistant coaches that were in place when Xavier came along were um, that, that we 
set him up for a fall, which was a bit disappointing because we said that to the president that we were quite happy to work with him to the best of the team, but there's no way we were we were doing anything that was uh, not for the best of the team. So I think as people, um, Bassie and I, um, Marty, the analyst, you know, it's not against as it goes against who we are and what we what we would do, but that was a disappointing thing because it was wasn't the case. So, four, yeah, sorry. Four, more, four more to say that. Four more I'll mm-hmm. try to say that. That's obviously come back to him. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Garbage also. So well, why wouldn't he say that? So that's fine. Exactly. Right, in the same time, yeah. you, you you could see, I mean, I, I was always amazed with with Galtier. Remember in the whole lawsuit he said, I asked Fabian Galtier to do me an explanation to write me a report on the explanation why the team wasn't doing well so, okay then he did the same thing with Vern. i asked Vern to actually address me in a powerpoint presentation or to send me a report about why is the team blah blah blah, blah. and then the same thing that you mentioned it earlier in the in the chat i asked xavier this this and this and that so basically i think he's only doing it to cover his ass legally in case there's a lawsuit he wants to be like listen i have actually asked him to pro- he did not produce it that's it. Remember, because that's the excuse he got for sacking Xavier. He said, I sat with Philippe Saint-André and Xavier, asked them to produce a report. They didn't. You know, so he's only trying to, to do this. So basically, yeah. long story short, I think it's, he, he's just trying to cover his ass, right? So but yeah, by, mate, look, by asking those things, it's the same, it's the same idea. And I don't, really, I don't really care what they say anyway, because um, the thing is that you've got to be comfortable with what you, what you do, who you are, and, and, and what you put into your anything anything you do and and i know and bassy know that mate we did everything everything we could to make that team successful copping all the shit from xavier and the president and you know i I like the president but you know some of the stuff that he does does cause you problems but um and and that's the 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 good thing about the team we had that started and finished is that everyone just put in 100 percent for the team and whether the 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 coaching staff was the one that we started with or not so yeah so may i'm not really bothered about the the comments about, about all that stuff because i know that know the truth so going back to better times anyway better times let's talk about your playing days briefly um because you obviously moved over to france and you were successful with purple and you won the top 14 but there's a story there isn't it because you you left there because you went on the british lions tour british and irish lions tour you couldn't play in the final, the last stage of the season. So just talk us through what happened there. What happened there? Um, so the year before, so 2008, um, was Christophe Porcu. He led this huge uh, remontada. I don't know how you'd say that. A comeback from for Perpignan. They had a, a basically a camp in the mountains. Ben, Benji wasn't teen. It was uh, Matamal, I think. And they got on the steam and came together. They had a fight against Stade Francais, and that was a catalyst for coming back and getting into the finals that into the finals that year. Um, and fighting has always been one of the recipes for Perpignan, just so you know. So when we got to the finals, we played in Marseille. It was, we played against you. You played that game, did you? Bench for Clermont? No, no, no. Were you too young then? No, I was oh. in Leicester actually. I was in Leicester. Um, so we played uh, Clermont in Marseille and it was 36 degrees. Uh, Jacques Brunel was a coach at the time. He put me on the bench. I was raging. Like I was, <laughs> I was raging. So he goes, yeah, but Christophe, you know, he, you know, he's, you know, I put Christophe in. I'm like, well, okay then. Vern was coaching again for Claremont against us that day. And it was probably the first time I met him actually. And he's like, mate, why didn't they pick you? I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. They put Christophe in maybe because they thought he'd be, you know, I, I just, I, Anyway, so I was still a little bit bitter from that, really, from being benched and being pumped by Claremont in Marseille. And, and so when the year after we were win the league, uh, Dan Carter, fire starter, was, in, was at the club, even though he was injured. And um, he, uh, we, were go, we were definitely going to make the finals. But because it was a Lions year, Geach was coaching and, you know, there was sort of whispers that, I might be in with a shout. Um, he did ask me if if uh, I was picked, would I choose staying for, to play for the finals or or go to the Lions tour? And I said, well, I would go Lions tour because 
you know, that I was, I played rugby till I was 68 years old and I was probably 40 then. It was never going to happen again. But, you know, at least I might have another shot with the top 14 if Perpignan by chance got to the, like, A, played me in the finals or got to the final or won. So um, I said, I'd definitely go. And that's something you just don't pass up, you know. So I went on tour because uh, the we met up in, in mid-May, went on tour. But during that time, Brian O'Driscoll said to me, look, Michael Checker has been in touch with me and he wants to know, would you be interested in coming to Leinster? I had one year left in the contract at Perpignan. And I was like, why wouldn't you want to go to Leinster? You know, great team. And, and um, but I've got one year left. But that that year, all that year, that we were successful in 2009, Chris Custer was coming out of contract and, and he's like, they didn't want to resign. Perkins didn't want to resign him. And he, I think he went back to Glasgow, didn't he? Beats, I think. Yeah. Um, so because he was leaving, they didn't play him. And that, that was rubbish for him. He was trying to get, get back in the Scotland team. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't want to spend an, a year on the bench because if Jacques is annoyed that I didn't go to play for the finals and I said look mate if if Perpignan are happy to let me go I will I would gladly go to Leinster so yeah I made the arrangements in that summer <clears throat> to move so I left Perpignan as a Perpignan player and then went back to Perpignan packed up my stuff and went to Dublin and so when you'd agreed verbally to go on the Lions tour you obviously then have to have the conversations with Jacques Brunel with the president of Perpignan and say you're not available for the Faz final. How did that conversation mm. go down? Like, they must have been pretty unhappy. Uh, yeah, but they, they understood. They understood um, that I wanted to do it. I mean, Bernard Guta was the, the coach, Ford's coach at the time. He was a good friend. And like he, he was disappointed, but he could see from my side that it was something that they couldn't turn down, you know? Um, I mean, I was disappointed. In an ideal world, it would have been amazing if the top 14 season finished and then you could go on the Lions tour, but it wasn't the case. So I, I sort of had to pick. I I didn't know that Perpignan would make the, the final and go on to win it. I, I um, because I, not that it made any difference on my on my decision, but um, I was in the hotel room with Stephen Jones and Durban watching the final, um, and it was awesome to see the only the only thing is I, I didn't get to play another final or to get to play in a final so you know, you got a few me, others but, though sure ah, good other stuff yeah which is good but you know and and that's the thing it's I, I don't regret that decision at all and that, that's the that's that comes down to what i was saying before as long as you can you know at the end of the day you can be happy with the choices you made and who you are then you're all, you're all good and then after a couple of years at Leinster, you moved back to France with Clermont. I think you arrived at the same time as Benji, didn't you? What were, what were your first impressions of, of Benji when you both rocked up at Clermont? Were you at the same time? Yeah, 2011. <laughs> Did you know? Really? I thought were you, you there? Me. Yeah, I was, was already there. a legend there. You know, but you were, <laughs> you were at the World Cup. No, no, what happens is that I think... No, you didn't play the World Cup that year, did you? No, 2011? I did. I did. Yes, that's why. That, so that you arrived a couple of months after because I didn't play the World Cup. So you were you were away from yeah. that time. Yeah. Well, a lot happened in two months, clearly, Benji. Absolutely. No, honestly, a lot happened. We didn't lose a game. We lost one game that last in nine games. So we were already legends. The thing is, too, most of the most of the Academy boys came through, uh, like Jean Marcelin Boutin. He, he he started playing there, Noah Nakatasi. They started so playing in that yeah, and Wes, my fat Wes back in the day. Um he uh in that period a lot of guys got some good footy in and that just set us up really for the end for the other year for the end for the other part of the year but yeah it was good the to like i sort of i had i had french when i was at perpignan and then because i've been away i'd sort of forgotten it so it was good to have benji there um to, to speak for me really um because you know benji likes speaking we, we all know like that <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> no, but it was good to have Benji there because he had, um, you know, he's obviously French, but well, um, but have that experience and a way in a different environment to come back into Claremont. I mean, we we're quite um, good any, that way. Anyway, we had a lot of people that shared a lot of different backgrounds and, and different ideas and and history. So uh, that was a good thing. I think we came together quite well. 
But um, yeah, we had a good time, Benjo. I mean, I played with the Heinze, one of the biggest, my biggest disappointments of my whole career, the 2013 Champions Cup final against Toulon. Stop it. We had an incredible season that, that <laughs> year. Uh, we did really, really well. Um, everything was going for us and we lose by one point, you know, that Dylan Armitage waving at Brock James. Uh, and it was, we, we, we were the better team that day. It just so happens because whatever, uh, because we did underperform because one decision of a ref, you know, rugby is like this. And we never really covered from that, but that was one of the biggest disappointments. Like you said, we, things really clicked. We had some incredible wins. I mean, we beat Leinster in Leinster, and I remember that was a big game for you. Smashed them, and, yeah. And, and, and we absolutely smoked them. And we were really, you know, putting some big, big, uh, big moments. Uh, I mean, it's, so it was, it was a really incredibly enjoyable time at Clermont when you know that you want to compete for every game and you, want, you know they're going to pick some guys from everywhere in the world to actually do better and better. And we just didn't deliver completely to 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 win in the title together, but it was still extremely enjoyable, like you said. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and that that final tier was was pretty poo, and and um, that sort of knocked on into the next week and that, against Cast. And that, I remember that. I remember that that training week was at, was probably the weirdest week training week I, I've ever had. Uh, it just was so flat, and I didn't really have much uh, you know confidence going in that game, but. Yeah, that that was uh that was a really that's a real sore point in that that final. To be fair, BG. thanks for, thanks for uh, making me depressed. <laughs> that was one of the lowlights. <laughs> so g- give us on the flip side, give us the the highlights of your time in, in France, Nathan. In France, um, I so like asshole, yeah, asshole. Yeah, well, that that was ridiculous. <laughs> that was that was another low light. Um, so that was after the the, the, the quarter final against Leinster. Another uh, we got beat in uh, Bordeaux. I was having a crack. I was having a, a fantastic game. Anyway, Vern takes me off, uh, but I got I got smashed off a, off a kickoff, and my rib was a bit funny. And I was like, well, my rib is a little bit sore, and Vern's getting old. Maybe he's just gone a bit demented, and he, he forgot he's taken me off. Put Jupy on, I think Julian Pierre on, but um, I tore the rib cartilage um, and I didn't really know and at training the next, the next week Lionel Four landed on me and some, like my rib cartilage is separated from my rib just, just going clunk, clunk, like, and it was sticking it was like stuck and I couldn't I just got I just lie there I couldn't move couldn't, I couldn't I couldn't do anything I, was going, I just went asshole <laughs> that's all I could say and I, was, I couldn't even get up couldn't walk and then uh, obviously Benji's is there pissing himself. T. Paolo is just pissing himself as well. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Yeah. And then T. Paolo turns around and looks at the physio. I think there's something wrong with his asshole. Uh, and so basically <laughs> everybody <laughs> called him, everybody called him <laughs> asshole until the end of the season. But he's just there complaining exactly. about his rib cartilage. And T. Paolo, who was, you know, the former hooker from Crusaders, yeah. really lovely bloke, really great in the changing right. room. He just turned around physio. I think there's something wrong with his asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, which and I heard that I'm trying not to laugh. I can hardly breathe, and I'm like, <laughs> but, uh, oh. but honestly, one of the most painful things in my life. Meant, but not the thing. The clinic, the clinic's only 100, uh, 200 meters up the road from the from the training field. So I managed to get up and, and shuffle my way into the clinic. By that time, I'm, I'm I'm white as a sheet and wanted to throw up. Oh mate, it was painful. That was really painful. Sounds but, like a real uh, highlight. Real highlight. Now, well, <laughs> Benji, I, apparently, so you've asked what my highlight was. Apparently, that's a highlight of Benji. <laughs> yeah. So you made it in, in, in Ted's pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, Beats can, uh, can attest to this. It's just uh, a big highlight, I think, is just living and learning about another culture, living in France, learning about another culture, meeting new people. I mean, this is outside, it's holistically speaking, and, and not talking about rugby. Um, but just been able to experience new stuff and, and you give your family a different experience. That leads on to this question and it's an opportunity to okay. give it back to Benji I, I, a little I, bit. I, I, I knew there was another question coming. I was, I was leading you in. <laughs> that leads on to this question, an opportunity to give it back to Benji a little bit. Um, you're the perfect person to ask this question to. You've played with Johnny and with Benji. Did you room with either of them? Who was the better teammate and give it back to them? Oh, shit. Um, the good thing about I'm going to do this politically, right? I can't I can't remember. <laughs> we've, we've no, we've roomed together, eh? Bench and Beats. Yeah, we would have. Yeah, obviously it's memorable because I don't remember doing it. But um, <laughs> which is a good which is a good thing, which is a good thing. 
right? Because if I did remember, that means you're, you're doing something wrong. Yes. Exactly. Because you don't you don't remember the good the good rumors, you remember the bad ones. Um, but I think um, I mean, you know these two clowns, they're they're good in the team environment, they're good good people. And I think you want you, you need good people in your team and in your rugby team. And um, you know, I enjoyed I'm not gonna say who was better, who was not, because they're both good dudes, right? <laughs> and um and, and that's all you want. You would just want to work with good people. Um I Benji probably blame me a couple of times for some shit line out calls which is okay 100%. Um, never my yeah. fault always yours <laughs> obviously obviously um benji hates throwing a lobby uh, a lobby a short lobby throw because he <laughs> always got into me about that um which is okay we just never called that and then if we did and it was shit it was his fault so um but yeah that's the the good thing about um these two guys is that um they're they're good team blokes and they do anything for the team and and that's what you know what you want absolutely um very disappointing though that you didn't uh, lay into them but hey um (laughs) i thought we'd gone off very lightly there nothing came out well done wagger no no that's uh that's our role boys that's our role um so just um tell us now are are you itching to get back into coaching what's what's next for you What's next for me? Uh, well, the, the next has already started. So I have taken a role with Gallagher Insurance. Uh, I am development director and I look, uh, look after the relationships between uh, PRL, the clubs and Gallagher, obviously with Gallagher being the title sponsorship of the premiership, the, spon- uh, the title sponsor of the premiership. Um, so I look after all those relationships, make sure that everyone gets what they need in, in re- regards to... Uh, players and access and all that kind of stuff and that to help Gallagher introduce rugby to their clients and their pro and their uh, future clients um, to to rugby uh, and, and make sure that um, we can use rugby as a, as a vehicle to win your business so um, that started obviously it started I'm in lockdown so it's, it's been a little bit it's been a little bit different I'm not saying it's you know, not exactly difficult but it's just a, a bit more of a challenge to to meet people over zoom and get get time in the diary to to, to speak to people but it's much more enjoyable to get to rubby ground and pretend that i'm actually doing something um but i'm not coaching or playing so you're not desperate to get back on the coaching field then and you mentioned as well you're in you're in cheshire so if alex anderson gives you a call and says hey fancy sale Ooh, nah, that's no, that's that's not that's not the case at all. But I spoke to Alex when I was down at Surrey's because we had a we had a uh, a sponsors day down there when we were allowed, and I mentioned it to him. It was just after Steve Diamond um, uh, stepped aside, and um, I said, "Mate, you come on, you making you come out the road? What are you doing?" And he said, oh. "Yeah," and he and he gave me a pretty much a straight bat and um, didn't give anything away. So. And that's that's all I know, boys. But um, no, at the moment, I'm pretty happy um, working at Gallagher. It's a good opportunity to to do something different. Uh, coaching at the moment, the, the coaching landscape, like you're saying, Johnny, you have to move around all the time. And um, and with COVID and all everything that's going on, I'm just quite quite happy to learn something new. I'm still and I'm still involved in rugby in, in, in a capacity. Um, which is which is awesome. I mean, I get to talk to good people, good rugby people. I mean, the rugby family is, you know, it, while it's quite large, um, it is you know, just feel uh, quite quite small. Everyone's got the same sort of values, and and that's quite good. So um, yeah, and if uh, and if the <laughs> if situation changes and we can get to a rugby game, I'll be really really happy about that. Amen. absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we all uh, well yeah. thanks so much for coming on the show today and sharing all your experiences in, in france with us and um big good luck for the the new role with galga yeah thanks very much um hopefully i will see you guys soon cheers wags cheers Wagga. take care my man cheers gents been a pleasure yeah, he's a legend um i one of the best like i still remember my first scotland tour i think i actually roomed with nathan and it was in durban in 2007 like ages ago and just awesome then completely looked after me lovely bloke uh missus and family are awesome as well um and yeah great to have him on he's, he's had some career like way too best. nice he's, to he's you been guys everywhere 
I know <laughs> we got off really, really, really lightly, but um, a total legend, a yeah, really nice boy. Yeah, he's he's had some career, that's for sure. Freakish. Uh, when you look, I mean, he's got so many. How many caps has he got for Scotland? Like seventy or maybe well, almost. He, he retired early as well, so he finished up at a World Cup. I think it was in the in New Zealand. I think he finished at the World yeah, Cup in 2011. New Zealand in 2011. Yeah. And he played on for years after that. Um, and I think he got 70, 80 caps. So he's one of the that's, highest. That's massive. He's got the British Nash Lions. I yeah. mean, he technically sort of won the top 14 with, with Perpignan. He definitely won one Champions Cup with, with Lane <laughs> yeah. Then he came back to us and he was 35. And the boy's like, what are you doing to resign a guy like him? And the he just beast. kept on going and going. And he was really good, very instrumental. And you can knew, you could tell he was going, he wanted to be a coach, especially line outs and forwards coach. He really had a lot of appetite and curiosity towards it. He was always been a serious bloke, good at organizing things and being thorough about what he does. And I was joking around about him and Jamie Cudmore not, not coming back until a Thursday. Bloody hell, they had some good games, the two of them. Yeah. They were just incredible. They were about 150 years old combined, but <laughs> the wow, two dinosaurs. They were good. No, they were good. They were good together. And they really, really, the both of them, Jamie, not maybe not as much as Waga, but they really stepped up in the big occasions. Jamie was always good. He was always ruthless, always a monster. But really, he, he like I mentioned when we had him, that memory, that monster game that he really lined up, Polo Connell. Heinze was the same. Heinze loves Heineken Cup and Champions Cup. And every big occasion, we played Toulon, ooh, he, was always, he wasn't the same player. We played Champions Cup, he wasn't the same player. And that's when I really recognize greatness, is that whenever you think the guy is limping from Monday to Thursday, and you're thinking, well, he's too old for this. But whenever the big occasion was there, he always, uh, always, always, you know, stepped up and was there and ready to deliver big, big performances. A huge fella who could cover a lot of ground. Uh, he, he was, was massive. The line out. I don't think people realize how big he. Like you say, Jamie Cudmore and Wagga, but like, no, no, it's the bulk that they had in terms of muscle bulk and the athleticism. They were yeah. unbelievable, the pair of them. And like you said, like the platform. I think of Wagga, and I always think back to like big stages, Clermont, Stade Marcel Michelin, and the things that he was doing. Like the images, remember of him like like holding down three Ulster players, being an absolute pest, a complete mutant, but just beasting people, and he did it consistently. He was a machine. When when you almost influence the refs to change a rule, that means that you're doing something right on the pitch, right? <laughs> he was doing like, so he, what, what is he? Six foot six, six. Yep. I don't even know. Six, like six. Something like that. But he would just around the rugs, grab as many guys. Cause technically you could, if somebody yep. was grabbed by somebody in the bound. ruck, he was, yep. he was part of, part of the ruck also. But at some point he was obviously taking it a little bit far that he was holding two guys with one hand, one with the other and falling over. He was with his two feet holding a, a yep. fourth guy. And they, to the point where we had to have a, uh, like a, a meeting with the refs in Europe saying, listen, none of that because Nathan Hines, where is he? Yeah, come over here. <laughs> right. What you're doing, that's it. Because everybody's copying you and it's becoming a, a, a street fight. So let's cut that. So that's that's a big big testament to how influential he was. Great guy. Obviously happy with his role at, at Gallagher, but surely we'll see him back in coaching soon as well. I'd say so. Yeah, I hope so. The thing is, Gallagher is an awesome company. Like they've recruited, they've got Hugh Vivian, um, Jill Douglas. Like it's a really big rugby company now. Obviously based on insurance, they're everywhere. But like he's such a smart, charismatic bloke. He'll be amazing for Gallagher, but like any club would be lucky to have him like in the Prem now, if he wants to stay in England to have him as a forwards coach, it'd be, you do really well. He's just such a good man. And then we need, we need to talk about, are you allowed to, you know, we talked about being a forwards coach and talk about line outs and stuff, but are you allowed to lift the ref up in the air to celebrate a win? <laughs> so I'll, I'll give, I'll give you my, my, my feeling. My, I'll give you my feeling of it. So Nevea was so chuffed to win in Bézier because obviously it's a tough, big old win and the last decision of the ref was going to be the decision maker to allow the, re the, the try or not from Bézier, whether they won or not. So he was already dancing around the ref, waiting for that. For he that saw his face. Eh? And then it's just a genuine, childish, stupid reaction. Okay, but it's genuine and kind and funny and passionate, right? It comes from the heart. It's not, he doesn't want to hurt them. He doesn't want to be angry. It doesn't come from any bad side of his heart. So, so I would forgive anything. To be honest, is what I said last week um, in, 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 on French radio. I was more pissed off about the reaction of the busier players. Yeah, look 100%. at them all the way around. They're all going up to the ref like I've never seen it. Like what I hate about football. Exactly. When I see those guys sprinting and coming to the face of the ref, ref they started screaming and stuff. And the ref is there, poor thing. I mean, I, I would distribute some red cards if I was a, a football ref. Like, don't even get close to my face. You're gone. 
and and all those busy guys are are we allowed to do this are we allowed to do that and even though it doesn't change the the faith of the game because the the score was the try was not meant to be allowed they're still there to complain so i'm like listen this is not rugby if we start to have problem in the in the stands, if we start to have disrespectful players to the to the refs, and if we start to have players who, after a big scruffle, after a big game, don't shake hands and do this thing of you know you smash the shit out of each other on the field and then you respect e each other off it, if we lose that, we lose everything we've got, and we lo lose our difference with any other sport. So I think it's it's a matter of obviously he did the uh, the, the Fijian player was a Haizuke. Yeah, I cannot yeah. touch the ref. He's a machine, okay? Do man. not touch the ref. <laughs> I repeat, do not touch the ref. You cannot do that. Yeah, but it's just a mistake. Okay, so let's let's not make it bigger than it is, especially at the moment. We're so chuffed to see some rugby that that's the last thing that we want is to be like, oh, he should be banned for X amount of weeks. So well, that's I hope it. he gets a week ban, like it should 100%. be 100%. Max, I hope that's it. That's the kicker for me is I hope that you obviously can't touch a ref. The ref's clearly embarrassed. You have to be embarrassed in that situation, but he's got no choice but to send them off. That's the sad of thing. Course, it's come it's out right of joy. Decision. It's the right decision. But I just hope that they look at circumstance, look at what's going on in the world, and like a weak max ban. Just, yeah. you know, give him a slap on the wrist, but let's get him back. He knows not to do it again. Because if you, the ref doesn't do anything, I saw JP Doyle talking about it. If like, if nothing's done, what's next? Is somebody going to grab yeah. and like give somebody a new, like you can't be touching a ref. So 100% the right decision, but just, you know, a weak ban and get him back in. He's learned his and lesson, it won't fact, happen again. I know for a fact that the ref went into the Nevers uh, change room after. It's funny, the ref went into the change room almost to, to address it. And he looked at the guys like, come on, what, what have you done? But almost wanted to apologize for giving him a red card. And before he said anything, the Fijian player came over and apologized. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm truly sorry. <laughs> it, it was a mistake. I didn't want, I didn't mean any disrespect. It's just that it was a stupid reaction. What do you mean to say? My, my heart is too big. <laughs> and yes. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think enough. And, and actually, they shook hands and, you know, and went, went from there. There was no disrespect wanted. And I think move on. Absolutely. And should we quickly talk about some of the rumors, transfer rumors? You love a transfer rumor, don't you, Benji? Contract agent time. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, if, if I heard that, what is it? The back row of Bath, Zach Mercer, that's what Zach you just Mason. told me is link, linked who i think to, by the to be fair i think is a very good player yeah. I, I really do rate him i think he's maybe not a number eight but he's not the biggest dude but wow he's got some he's wheels athletic, he's got man. Some really yeah he's got some real ability i really enjoy playing uh, seeing him play it, it more disappoints me to think what the, f what the hell is wrong with bath i mean how could they not keep their, their quality players they've got fantastic Whoa. players all right they could have underhill mercer and what is and faletao and they're just constantly in the middle of not really performing and being good. And especially players don't want to stay. Uh, so I think, is he from there originally? He's a bit from he's everywhere. So his dad okay. was my, he was my defense coach. His dad was my defense coach up in Glasgow. And so, so Gary's the dad, Zach's the boy. So Zach, they were obviously, Gary was a leaguey and he played um, down south in England. So Zach was born down south, but then did finish his schooling up in Scotland. Okay. And like you said, really talented player. I think he played maybe Scotland under 18s and then went to England under 20s. But you say, like, how can how, how are Bath not retaining the talent? So Zach's obviously one of those kids that isn't going to play ahead of Billy Vinopola, isn't going to play ahead of Curry, isn't going to start in an England jersey. And I don't think, like, Bath obviously wants to keep him. He's English qualified. He's, he would be easy QP, obviously. Um, he's important to them. But Montpellier have obviously just opened the checkbook and been like, boom, here you come and they can't compete. That's the only reason that he would go to Montpellier. Yeah, but you, you always go have there. To, to counterbalance the money with the risk that he's taken for his career. That, like we said with Heinze, we spoke about two hours about the yeah. the, la the lack of stability of this club. So yeah, yeah, you might take a big check and have a bit of sunshine for a while, but he still needs to play, enjoy his rugby, build himself as a player. That's it. So big he's risk. saying he's saying goodbye to his English. Any hope he had or had retained of playing for England is gone. That's gone, shredded. You then go to Montpellier. Yes, you take a nice paycheck. You live in the sunshine, but. You temper that with you're under Philippe Saint Andre. They're in dire straits. The second bottom of the top 14. It doesn't look like the quality of the rugby is going to improve anytime soon. For what now, going for, for now, Johnny. You said Philippe Saint Andre. Philippe Saint Andre. Admit Next year, change. Coach until June. So, so maybe so the guy is signing with a coach that doesn't even need. Well, obviously any coach would like Zach Mercer. Okay, but maybe a, a coach would want to come with his own number eight or number six. You know, you just don't know the 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 exactly the uncertainty. It's a huge risk. Big. Although maybe behind the scenes, they've already got a coach in place who said, I want to bring this guy and as part of the project. We don't know that. But if you're Zach Mercer, you're signing in blind faith purely for a big paycheck. In my opinion, it's a bad move. 
And what about the slightly off the wall one? Israel Falau to Toulon. Any truth in that whatsoever with all his baggage? I don't know, mate, but I would I, I want to see him back in Union, like in spite of the scandal and, and what's gone on and points of views and religious. I won't get into it, but mate, he's one of he's one of the best fifteens in the world. And I think there's one place that you can go and be forgiven or people are less politically correct, Benji, I could say. Um like France and the top fourteen would suit him down to the ground. He'd be exceptional in France. He's obviously at the Catalan Dragons and and doing really well in in league, but it'd be great to have him back and Toulon would be a great fit, 100%. Yeah, it's, it's one of them. I think that he can have, he can believe whatever he wants as long as he doesn't offend others by expressing it. Actually, I, actually, I, I really don't care. I think we're all completely different. Uh, we all have the, the right to believe in whatever we want. It's just the offense given by, by expressing it in such a harsh way, even though you have to understand if that's his belief, that's his belief, you know, no, no problem. Uh, he's obviously, like Johnny said, one of the best, one of the most uh, incredible, uh, talented um, fullbacks or just backs attacking style rugby in the world. So you want to see him on the field, right? Um, th my only issue is that the club that's going to take him is going to have to open the checkbook because he's going to have a lot of he's going to have a lot of offers from a bit of everywhere in the world. And I just hope that he picks a, a place where it's not only going to be about the checkbook. But he's actually going to be able to enjoy his rugby, enjoy his time. If he's lived in Perpignan, he's got he, he, he's starting to love a little bit the French sunshine. Then going to Toulon would be extraordinary, and they will allow him to be, like you said, to be a bit a bit loud and and, and a bit crazy. But for, for Toulon to do that, it's going to be a matter of salary cap, and then we're going to have to address. So I'm excited to see him play in in, in, in top 14. If he decides to 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 get in, not put a leash, you know, but understand that what he says can 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 hurt, and and can be sore for others, and actually take a decision that will that will be beneficiary for his his well-being, his career, and just his, to see his his, his God-given talent because he can be extraordinary. And just finally. Anyone know what's going on with Gabriel Ibitoy? Because Agen don't seem happy with him. Do they? Is he going to Montpellier? What's what's happening with him? Well, he was phenomenal at the start of the year, but the rest of the team at Agen wasn't. Um, and he signed, obviously, came over to France with a pro de deux clause. So if they get relegated, he has a, a clause that he can get out and sign for another team. So I don't know. It's, it's a weird one for Agen to hit back at him. Um, when actually on the field, he produced the, goose, the goods and he was one of the few shining lights of that Agen side. Um, I don't know, it's just bad for him to play in the press and to be slacking him off for, for looking at other teams. That's clearly the realistic, the realistic situation that they all find themselves in. The club isn't in a situation where they can retain him for next year. He's, he's played well. He's going to attract offers from other places. I don't know what you think, Benji, but... Uh, we, we spoke about it. For one, the whole Agen season, unfortunately, is, is a sham. Go on, yeah. They haven't won a game. Uh, it's very, very complicated. They got in a fight coming back from a European game that they didn't uh, because guys were pissed on the plane in front of some, you know, some young fans. So, so the season is not going well. The coach got sacked. Uh, then another coach comes in and then the president is disappointed with it and put, uh, picks on players. Not doesn't pick on players, but like and, uh, states the names of guys he thinks are not performing well and not giving everything for a jersey and pull them out of the, of the squad. Um, and then, but that's so that's the general atmosphere, unfortunately, at Agen, which is not going well. They're going to get relegated and things are not, are not going their way. And on top of that, this summer, remember when he signed, we said it's a funny signing for him to take a big well, risk good. to go to Agen. He you know, really and he's good. very good. So, like Johnny said, he's going to get, he's going to attract some interest. Um, I think maybe he lost interest in the Agen season, this season also because he was expecting a lot more, maybe got some poor. Um, some some poor advice from his agents or from from the, in his decision makers, um, so I, I don't think it's very uh, extraordinary to see him being linked to other clubs. I think Bayonne came to the charge to try to get him during the season, and then Montpellier, and Montpellier as well. have done it. So I think he's going to leave, and basically the club's decision is because we're going to get relegated. If you're going to leave, you might well might as well leave now, uh, save ourselves a little bit of cash, and and and, and sort out the solution now. Excellent. Thanks, Benji. Thanks, Johnny. Good to be back, guys. I missed you both. It's good to be back. <laughs> good to be back. Have a good day, guys. Enjoy. Looking forward to next week. Absolutely. A big thanks to Nathan Hines as well and for all of you for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review, and we'll be back with another episode next week. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Cheers fellas. Bye.